We had a job to work out why it was successful. Now, I initially thought, well, they each have to pay $800 each a month, a year, to be part of it. And that gives them a, a really good marketing um, budget to work with. I thought it's all about what they've invested. As I went around, I suddenly discovered it was much more simpler than that. Because when you signed up, not only did you have to pay this amount of money to be part of it, but you had to make an agreement that you would put in the most prominent position in your gallery or shop a simple plaque. And on that plaque were these words, I will market my neighbour as well as I market myself. You know how that translated? <coughs> Every time you visit a place, you can almost be guaranteed as you were leaving, people say, which way are you heading? Are you going north? Listen, whatever you do, don't miss that incredible glassworks factory in the north there. It's only 25 k's away. I tell you what, it's the best one we have in the Republic. You can't afford to miss it. And you know that word of mouth stuff is worth a thousand flyers. Every one of those comments, it was all about integrating. And I think, you know, we do the, the linkage to each other as communities. I've got a friend who runs, and many of you know, that very popular bakery in Beechworth. You know what Tom O'Toole does? When you go in there, there are placemats on the table that actually don't talk up the Beechwood Bakery. You reckon you're already there. What do they do? They tell you the other six businesses you've got to visit in Beechworth before you leave town. His simple one little gesture to support other people. Imagine if every business had one or two of those things in terms of business collaboration. When it comes to community collaboration, how do we do the same? Africans have this wonderful problem. If you want to go faster, go alone. But if you want to go further, go together. And I think we've got to preach that message in every way possible. You know, the reality is that that glass is both half full and both half empty. But too much of our, I think, top-down approaches tend to always want to focus on the half empty bit. We've got a high youth unemployment problem. We've got poverty. We've got to actually focus. And it just seems to me that a lot of the mindset stuff is where we need to start changing people. We are very good at doing those maps. But my experience is it takes 20 seconds to come up. Most people know what doesn't work. And we need that map. It's very important. But more important, we need that map. And they are the maps that we don't seem to put our effort into in terms of doing it. Now, this is one country town that I think just is never... I mean, it's a dying town in the Hunter. Why would you... It might be a smart driver education sign, but, you know, to me, that is how so many communities are. They want to talk their community down. They want to keep focusing on... The, the needs, the problems, the deficiency, the limitations. Well, that's important. But much more important is also to spend equal time on talking about possibility, on asset, on capacity, on what actually we've actually got in terms of where it's actually at. And that's where this whole approach to community development, a lot of people are now embracing called asset-based community development, is just so important. It's a mindset thing, it's a practical thing, and it's really about trying to connect those assets. Now, I just, this is the story that this, my experience once was to go to this place and I was told if you want to understand how to use your assets, visit this soup kitchen in Cincinnati. I ended up getting there and it turned out to be a black Baptist church in the worst neighbourhood of Cincinnati. I thought, what can I learn from a soup kitchen? I'd worked as a volunteer in a soup kitchen when I was at uni. I thought I understood it. To be quite honest, most soup kitchens are what you'd call a community feeding centre. Amazing compassion, but fundamentally we are there to feed people who just need a break in terms of a good meal and often to be taken out of the weather. I go into this one and the thing that I notice is it's not a community feeding centre, this is a community eating centre. And the difference being is I couldn't work out who were the homeless and unemployed and who were the organisers. This was a huge family of 200 people enjoying a meal together and having a lot of fun. Like, I've never been into a soup kitchen that had a jazz band playing in the corner. I had the most amazing conversations around that table you wouldn't even get at a Rotary Club dinner. I couldn't wait to the end of the night to talk to the Baptist minister. His name was Damon Lynch III, six foot four. Afro-American with a ponytail right down past his bum. I'd never seen a Baptist minister like that before. And I said, Damon, what's happened? And he said, well, if you'd been here six months ago, you would have seen a typical soup kitchen. 200 homeless, unemployed people come in. We feed them. 
they go out and boy, I thought we were doing a great job. And then I make the mistake of all mistakes, I employ a typical generation Y kid who wants to change everything within three minutes of being in the job. And she says to me one night, Pastor, I think we're doing a great job, but guess what? Their lives are not changing. They're here tonight, and they're back tomorrow night, and the next night, and the next night. And you know why, Pastor, their lives are not changing? Because we do not know them. Damon said, I was really angry. I've been here six years, she's been here six minutes. But the more I thought about it, the more I realised she was right. So what did he do? He mobilised all the young people in his church, and he taught them the number one tool that we use in ABCD. It's called Appreciative Inquiry. It's about having a conversation where you drill into the positive core in a person's life or an organisation's life and not the negative core. And so those young people went in over two weeks and had a whole pile of conversations in that soup kitchen around those questions. And the one thing you'll notice about those questions is there isn't one about unemployment and there isn't one about homelessness. They're actually all about what's good about you, what's your contribution, what is it that you dream to do? What is it that other people think you're good at? And he said, the very first thing I discover is out of 200 people, over 100 of them actually said they like cooking. And we are a soup kitchen where well-meaning goodies stood on this side of the counter, serving the poor buggers on the other side of the counter. I immediately invited 25 of them to take over all the catering. He said in three months, every one of them now works somewhere in the hospitality industry in America. He said, no employment program had that type of outcome. Why did I see a jazz band in the corner that night? Because 51 people out of 200 had played a musical instrument at some stage in their life, and we started joining them all up. I had a conversation with a guy who says, as a kid, I love fishing. I've been through police checks. I now take two boys from a single-parent family where there isn't an adult male role model, and I take them fishing once a week. That group has founded two building cooperatives because... There are enough trade skills in the group and they're renovating derelict housing in Cincinnati. <coughs> and in the words of Damon Lynch III, we were feeding folks, but we weren't getting to know them. And that just radically changed my whole approach. That's why I'm just so passionate about asset mapping. We all keep complaining. We don't have people to do things, and yet we don't invite people to be contributors. We still see them as objects, often of our work and whatever. That's that study I mentioned earlier. 82% of people said they knew someone, um, they, they volunteered because they knew someone, asked them to do something they like doing. The catch with that is you've got to know what people like doing. What are people's passions? Why is it that less than 5% of people join a parents and citizens group? Because most of those parents and citizens group don't ask people to do things around what they're passionate about. They ask them to do a job that the PNC needs to be done rather than starting with what turns people on and whatever. Now that group is a classic. And we've talked a lot about social media. Now I'm working on the youth empowerment strategy for the United Arab Emirates at the present time in Dubai. Because we have a special relationship with the Department of Interior Affairs, and I won't tell you what they do, we can monitor how many electronic devices are in a classroom at the university. And I was interested with 23 students in second year at the University of Dubai, how many electronic devices do you think our mechanism picked up were in the classroom at that one time? And by that, mobile phones, tablet, computer. 23 students, how many electronic devices? How many? There was 124. Now they had mobile, they had, mo they had multiple, multiple, uh, mobile phones. Most on every head. Report, Sorry? When we do parent engagement, most families are flabbergasted when they start to count how many devices can connect to the internet. And I think the one we did with the community cats, the average was between 10 and 21 devices in and out. Yeah. yeah. And they, they don't even know. Yeah. Now I just know, I'll have a daughter saying, Ellie, can you concentrate on what I'm trying to talk to you about? Dad, I am concentrating. No, you can't be. You've got a phone in this ear, you're on your hair, you're uh, texting here. Yes, so? I'm still concentrating on what you're doing. They're multitasks and so on. And this is the group that we need to engage. Now, I love this story. Sam Johnson, he's a 21-year-old. The day of the very first earthquake in Christchurch, he turns on the morning TV program to see the devastation that that October 2010 earthquake had done. He couldn't believe it. 
He rings the local municipality, the local council, asks for the emergency coordinator, management coordinator, so I want to volunteer, I want to get in there and help people. He was moved, he was physically and emotionally moved. And the council coordinator said, we can't take everyone, Sam. We've got a little list that we'd like to go through to check if you've got the skills we're looking for. They go through this thing over the phone and at the end of it he says, listen, Sam, really appreciate you want to do something, but you know what, we think you'll get in the way. We don't think you've got what we need. Thank you for your offer. Well, to put it bluntly, Sam was pissed off. This guy does have gifts, so what does he do? He uses his social media gift to mobilise his own army called the Student Volunteer Army, and for two weeks, this is the group that cleaned up Christchurch, not the management coordinator from the council. 9,000 students on average for two weeks marched into Christchurch, and this is the group without a plan, but just with a desire to help and mobilise through texting and social media actually came and they are the ones who cleaned away all of that uh, massive um, mud and whatever. Absolutely an inspiring story. This year he is the um, person of the year in New Zealand and whatever. An amazing story of how to do it. And he's a great illustration of both young people not being mobilised, recognised or mobilised and secondly this thing about social media. But the other thing is we've got heaps of young people who have amazing gifts. Chloe is 18. She lives in Port Macquarie. She's an artist. She has got a $20 rake from Bunnings. And what she is able to do on a beach in terms of art is absolutely mind-blowing. She just goes and does it. You've got people like this in your community who just have an incredible gift and whatever. How do we mobilise all of these people? Um, and where do we start you know, out of it? In the middle of winter where beaches are deserted, what a way to have an artist down there as a way to attract people to your beaches in winter and all this stuff. The mind boggles at how Chloe could be really mobilised in terms of what's possible. I love that quote, a strong community has a lit treasure hunt mentality in which residents look at everyone as bearing gifts. And I love what Sitting Bull said, let's put our minds together and see what we can make for our children. What I love about working with uh, American Canadians, uh, um, uh, Canadian um, American natives, is they'll often talk about when we plan, we plan for seven generations. What vision? seven generations out is often their thinking and whatever. And there's a whole pile. Have a look at the one city I love, the city of Ongapuringa. If you're looking for a creative way to get conversation going, check the city of Ongapuringa in, uh, in Adelaide and so on. Now, how many people have discovered this? I just need to tell you this. A young Victorian, she'd be 25, has designed it. Some of you use a tool called Bang the Table. Some of you use Survey Monkey. I can tell you this is 10 times better than all of them and 10 times cheaper. For $99, this is a way that you can actually lock into people's Facebook, Instagram, and all this stuff. It is the most useful social media tool I've known. Just Google Town Hall Social. Town Hall Social is what you've got to Google. You can see the website there, www.townhallsocial.com. And this young woman who lives in Darabin, just in Preston, has designed the most interesting, helpful thing. What I love about it, we, there's now sporting clubs are now using it as a way to get out, getting people commenting on issues and getting people, and you can just see the way, um, you know, this, this is a rugby club in Sydney, do you think that Josh Reynolds' return will make the difference this Friday night? And it's amazing how many people they've engaged in their community in the conversation around things like that. Alzheimer's used to get two hits a month on their website. One thing alone, 600 people came back, um, read the, the thing. It's very, very good. $99 a month, and they give you backup support to do it. It's so cheap, but what I love, it is so simple to actually use. Just a wonderful tool. Um, lots of, this is the city of Subiaco. 20,000 people in Subi, they mobilised 7,000 residents to be part of a community conversation about where's the city going. And I'm in a genuine conversation. That's phenomenal kind of like uh, ways that they've done it. But again, just their creativity of getting people engaged in the whole thing and whatever. Um, this is the one about acting with idea opportunity. 
that I think is important. When we kicked off a lot of the consultation in post-earthquake Christchurch, one of the first things was a weekend to bring people together. And in one weekend alone, 110,000 ideas were generated about the future of the city. 110,000, mainly by just getting people around tables, filling in their ideas, putting them up, linking them together, organising conversation. Everyone in the course of a shower has thought of good ideas. How do we really tap into all of that? Now, one of the best ideas I've come across in, in Christchurch, and I've discovered they've pinched it out of America. There's now 30 cities in America have what they call an awesome foundation. Want to know about that? Just Google awesome foundation. In Christchurch, they call it the Ministry of Awesome. And I think every city, neighbourhood, needs one of these. And what is it? They simply organise a one-hour get-together, and in uh, Christchurch, they call it the coffee and jam lunch. Really simple, there is coffee and jam and bread provided. And fundamentally, every Tuesday between 12.30 and 1.30, they have two people who've got either a social or an economic idea for their community of Christchurch, and they've got eight minutes to do a pitch. And the rest of the time is getting people's feedback about what they think of that idea. Or, do you know so-and-so is doing a similar thing? Or, you know who you should talk to? Can you tell me more about that? You know what, this idea is so good, I'd be willing to give you $500 to kick it off. Now, that's been running now for two and a half years, and over 200 ideas have seen the light of day through that Ministry of Awesome. They've now set up also once a month a panel of five people that if you've got a good idea, you can actually register a 45 minute coffee meeting at a local coffee shop and those five people from across the city who've got connections and understand innovation, understand how to get an idea off the ground, will spend and have a coffee with you and just give you clues about how to take that idea somewhere. We complicate everything. The simplicity of this type of stuff, I find just absolutely amazing. How many people have been to Balls? I need to give you the story. Balls has the best location of any town in New Zealand. It sits at the intersection of Highway 1 and Highway 3. And yet, despite that, half the shops in that main street are closed, and it's one of those towns you accelerate through rather than slow down, stop, and hop out of your car and spend. It's boring, it's dull, it's just an unattractive little place. We had 25 people gather to say, what could we do? We were lucky, there was a 90-year-old in the audience. And when we did our little introductions like we did earlier, he proudly said, I'm 90 years old. There was a bit of an evil bit in me who immediately said to him, what's it like to be 90? And he said, you know what, when you consider the alternative, it ain't bad at all. You know? <laughs> And then when we talked about what's our passions, he said, I've only got two passions left in life, model railways and women. But he said, at 90, I'm getting a little bit old for model railways. The guy, the guy has a sense of humour, you know. When we get into what, what assets we've got, he said, the name, Bulls. He said, we should promote ourselves as the only town in New Zealand where you get milk from bulls. We should become a sister town to cows in England. He had a whole pile of these stupid one-liners, you know. But he was good in the group because he got other people thinking. And one guy said, you know what, Bill's right. The name is incredible, but, you know, we should become a town like Noada. And we should actually become the unforgettable town. And we should invite every business and institution in our town to change their name to a bull name. And then let's start promoting ourselves as the bull town. And so one restaurant's full as a bull, the other one's delectable. The bank is called Bankable. It got held up about six months ago. By, someone came in the middle of the night and stole the ATM. The committee by 7.30 next morning had a banner across the front of the bank saying, Robbable! And uh, <laughs> that appeared on the front page of New Zealand's number one newspaper. You tell me how many towns in this region have appeared five times in an international airline magazine? Ball says. Amazing. And the result is today there are four new coffee shops, there are half a dozen new restaurants, a boutique brewery, Toilet block is relievable. Everyone wants to be photographed out of the toilet block. One church is forgivable. The other had to go for redeemable. Um, the bank is indispensable. The town hall is sociable. The information office is informable. Everyone's responsible in the town and everyone thinks it's possible. You know, Little town, lots of fun. But I tell you, it's about getting people together. It's amazing where ideas can go. 
Now this guy is in Woodford. Why are most of your business, you know, you've got a dreadful kind of like set of shops and whatever. Here's a guy who's a fourth generation fruit and veg seller. He lives in Woodford in Queensland. 20 minutes down the road is Caloundra. Coles have a 24 hour, seven day a week store in Caloundra. They have 10 times his range at two thirds of his price. How do you cope? Well, you don't cope unless you think outside the box. See what his asset base is about, it's about Elvis. He reckons the best $24 he ever spent was changing the name by deed poll to Elvis Parsley. You shop his grape lands and you come wandering into that shop dressed and he's dressed like that singing not Viva Viva La Vegas but Viva Viva La Veggies. He's reworded all the songs of the king. You know what? Those women are not in that shop for pineapples and bananas. They're primarily there for the retail experience he's giving. You know, on an average day, he attracts 10 tourist buses to his shop. Some days he requires 10 staff. He sells 1,000 postcards um, a month. He sells 500 copies of his DVD. Amazing story of success. The local Chamber of Commerce guy called him a Fruit Loop when he started. They now have asked him to open on Sunday and they'll pay him to open because he is the honeypot business of the town. People stop at his business and then they wander into the others. That's what appears on Facebook. That's what modern tourism is actually all about. He's amazing. Now, we've got to get more creative when it comes to how we promote ourselves. Innovative marketing. Beachwear. I knew Beachwear 30 years ago when it was galvanised up. It only had two industries, an asylum and a jail. You couldn't give a business away. Four months ago, they won the award in Australia's top tourism magazine as the number one tourist town of Australia. Why? I can tell you, it's one guy. His name was Tom Toole. He also changed his name by Dean Pohl to Tom O'Toole because he got sick of being called Shovel and Dickhead and $24 was worth changing the name. But we know that's what his bakery looked like 30 years ago. He had to close it also when he bought it to get rid of the rats out of it, six weeks. Opened it with six staff. Today he runs the biggest turnover bakery in Australia. 76 staff. You know how many customers he'll attract this year for that bakery? 800,000. There's only 300, there's only 3,000 people in Beechwood. It's on a road to nowhere. That's what it looks at nine o'clock in the morning. And that's the figures. And the question you've got to ask is how do you make dough his way? How do we start getting people thinking outside the box. He's replicated it in five other towns. He now is one of Victoria's biggest regional employers. He now employs, I think, 230 people in regional Victoria. Well, that's one of the biggest issues in regional Australia. It's called customer service. This guy's got an amazing scheme in terms of it. This guy never takes less than $20,000 on a Sunday, but he does spend $1,500 on a jazz band on the balcony. Our businesses have got to start thinking outside the box in terms of where it's at. He's a food business, smells the strongest sense of the human body. He's got pipes running through his bakehouse to his veranda and fans on the veranda pumping hot bread smells up and down the main street. Old fashioned retail methods, worth it. <coughs> Here's a guy who travels around three days a week and goes to every B&B hotel motel within a 200 kilometre radius of Beechworth gives him a bag of fresh biscuits and a what are these? They're all numbered in the top right hand corner. He tracks them. One in three end up back in the bakery. Why don't you treat your customer to a free cappuccino at the Beechworth Bakery? Amazing. He reckons particularly Kiwis will drive two hours out of their way for a free coffee, you know, <laughs> in terms of it. I'd give you lots of stuff. The way he trains his staff. I love that quote. I spend a lot of money training the staff, so locals think I'm investing too much. They say, Tom, what if you train them and they leave? I usually reply, what if I don't train them and they stay? You know? <laughs> you know this guy set up an exchange program now with three bakeries, one in Ireland, one in Norway, one in New Zealand, where his staff can swap jobs for 12 months. They swap houses, they swap cars, they swap business, uh, uh, jobs, they keep their same partner and have a fantastic <laughs> year away. I mean, you tell me a business in Geelong that last year sent four of their young staff to America to do work experience? Tom Vip. 
Now, why aren't we learning from people who are on our doorstep about, hang on, we've got to be different. And this is part of what I think a healthy community is about. There's a whole pile of things. So that whole thing about how do you get idea and opportunity assessment, have we got processes in place for that? The whole thing about getting people to embrace change. Now, when you lose everything like they have in Christchurch, well, or not everything, but in Christchurch, when you see what happened through those 11,000 earthquakes that have actually had, and the devastation and destruction, um, and you can now win an award where you're now one of the 100 most resilient cities in the world. It's just an amazing achievement. Now, that's your youth centre. How do you now start thinking outside the box when you, your youth centre is reduced to that in terms of it and whatever? And as I imagine when you don't have everything, you start to look at the world differently. Well, how do we do it without an earthquake? How do we start seeing utopia? And if you want to look at what some amazing community groups are doing to reinvent Christchurch, go to the website of some of these groups. They are just doing some amazing stuff. Like, when you don't have a library, do you really need a library? You've got plenty of empty refrigerator units that don't work any longer. You've got plenty of spare spaces in streets. Why not create street libraries? Run on an honour system. New places for art. New places to run concerts. I love this one. This is a business. It's where you can go and dance 24 hours a day. There's an old washing machine that you put coins in. I've seen people at midnight waltzing around here on their own. Two lovers having a waltz and whatever. Put their coins in. This is an amazing initiative. What have we got a lot of? Space. And this group, Gap Filler. Haven't got a youth centre, but you know what we've got a lot of? We've got a lot of pallets. And here's a group of volunteers that built this as a community centre. Temporary, it's called a pop-up one. It was there for 18 months. Just amazing what volunteers can do. The ways pop-up businesses happen, the use of containers, a whole shopping centre rebuilt using containers and whatever. Urban farms, I love this one, the library there. So we've got these wonderful treasures no one sees. Why don't we repaint the treasures from the thing and do them as murals and all these blank walls. And they call it Faces from the Collection. What a way for the local town, kind of like uh, art gallery, to reconnect within a place like Christchurch and whatever. That's where a picture theatre was. Now you don't need a picture theatre to run films. What do you need? You need six guys on bicycles willing to pedal fast <laughs> and whatever. And I think we've got, uh, where's the 10,000 uh, kilometre cyclist? I mean, um, here's somewhere you can travel. Walls, fantastic places to kind of like start getting poetry going and comments and bringing people together. Christchurch has taught me so much that when you lose something, you start to think outside the box. How do we do this type of stuff without an earthquake? And I love that. Amidst the shades of glass and twisted steel, beside the fallen brick and scattered concrete, we begin to understand there's beauty in the broken. Strangers do not live here anymore. Just love what I have actually learned out of Christchurch. And here's one of the women driving it. She's the one who was the mayor 20 years ago who created the wonderful Christchurch we knew before the earthquake. She's the one who created the Ministry for Awesome. And she, after being retiring for 25 years, has bounced back as the highest voted councillor. She's now the deputy mayor. Her name is Vicky Butt. She's immediately introduced giraffe awards for people who are prepared to stick out their neck and have a go. She's immediately got people talking up, not talking down. And this is what she says, I think negative people should be taxed. They require an incredible amount of energy. They're like corgis nibbling at your ankles. And I'm show, sure they exist to show us the difference between heaven and hell. That's how she talks. But we need people getting people talking up, not down. She reckons the number one message of leadership needs to be we can do it type stuff and whatever. I love this one she uses. When facing a difficult task, act as if it's impossible to fail. When going after Moby Dick, bring along the tartar sauce. <laughs> I unfortunately pinched that for a local government conference recently and Greenpeace were in the audience. They, did not, they didn't appreciate my quote. This whole thing about change and taking responsibility. How do we do that? It's got to be a constant process. And the final thing I just wanted to mention is this thing called leadership and whatever. And that was that quote from that report that the Keating government Commission McKinsey and Co to do. 
given the task of rejuvenating region, a choice of 50 million or 2 million and 20 committed local leaders, we would choose the smaller amount of money and the committed leaders. What is your leadership development strategy? What's the funding they're putting into it? Because leadership is at the heart of it. And I am amazed across this country how people are rediscovering all of that stuff. Now, how many people have been to Tumbarumba? Beautiful spot, isn't it? Two and a half thousand people in Tumbarumba. They have a community bank. They've been putting it back. They sat down and said, what is the biggest challenge of our community? And they said, it's leadership renewal. Do you know what they've done for the last six years? The local bank, the local school, the local council, the local community service supporters, the local bowling club have all come together and they support every year 11 and 12 student to walk the Kokoda Trail. Now you can imagine every two years this happens. Over the last six years, 159 of their young people have walked the Kokoda Trail. 130 locals have joined them. And I tell you what, when you walk the Kokoda Trail, you discover yourself, you discover what leadership's about, you discover what being a global citizen's about, you discover where you can fit and make a difference. This is not a town that suffers from leadership any longer. This is not a town that suffers from people not putting up their hands or wanting to get involved. Two and a half thousand people do that. What type of strategies could we put in place and whatever? And I suppose that, as I said, is the, uh, the eighth one that's on the list. We've run out of time. We would have had more conversation and if we'd had time, we'd have loved to have got you into a cafe conversation and say, where do we now take all of this stuff? I think that's for a future workshop that we need to look at and whatever. It ain't rocket science stuff about what builds a healthy, resilient, sustainable, caring, inclusive, connected type community or local economy. It's about some basics. And if we're not dealing with the basics, then really we're not dealing with where the starting points are. Those eight things in that list I think are helpful. You've also got within your little pack some other stuff that we haven't had time to use. One of them is put out by the Centre for Community Resilience, called the Community Resilience, which is this portrait. They claim that there are, and this is a Canadian thing, again, it correlates with what we've been talking about today, 22 or 23 characteristics there. And then the other one, if we'd had time, we would have got into talking about local economic development. I've just given you a couple of handouts that we use. One is particularly, I think, there are six critical ways that you can generate jobs and economic life in the community. Um, and there's a summary of that with a whole pile of examples of what communities and regions across Australia are doing under each of those uh, six category headings. And finally, there's a sheet there just called Community and Economic Development. Because I actually believe that a healthy economy, a healthy community, are the two sides of the same coin. And we'll never have a healthy economy without a healthy community and vice versa. And there are a few process stuff in there that you may find helpful.